Have you ever tried to come up with an original idea? Something like a, a joke, perhaps? It's, uh, it's actually pretty hard. So in my struggles, rather than blindly trying to come up with jokes, I started to look for a process. What is a joke and how do people come up with jokes? It really only led to a bunch of generic findings. A joke is when you defy expectation. A joke is the relief of stress and laughing is communicating to others that this situation isn't dangerous, which is like, wow, amazing, very helpful. Now back to actually coming up with a joke, please. Of course, it's not just about coming up with a joke, because what is a joke? It's simply an idea that makes people laugh. So a key to understanding how to come up with an original joke is to figure out how to create an original thought or idea. So how do people come up with new ideas? Some of the smartest people known today are literally only known for their ability to come up with a new idea. So it's as simple as that, new idea, profit. But how does one actually come up with a new idea? Well, what is a new idea? What's this process called? Is it what we consider creativity? Uh, sure. I mean, it literally has the word create in it. Let's start there. Have you ever played a game where you whisper something around in a group and it passes around and by the time it reaches the original person, it's basically an entirely new sentence? Basically this. Where did that new sentence come from? This is amplifying the effect of misinterpretation, but it's this act of misinterpretation that new ideas can form. Alright, pack it up boys, we solved it. Who would have thought that the mistakes and interpreting things wrongly would have been the secret to new ideas? It's really interesting insight into language, how an idea from one person's head is condensed into words, which can be communicated to another person who decodes those words and transforms them back into an idea. All the information of an apple, the smell, taste, size, color, and shape are all encoded in the word apple. If I say apple, you'll generally picture all that information automatically. It's quite amazing, but here's where creativity comes in. Let's pretend you don't know what an apple is and I try to describe one to you. I tell you the size, shape, and color of it, but what you picture is something like a pomegranate. That's not the exact idea I was trying to communicate, but it's a similar object and a new interpretation of the data. The end result could be considered a creative new idea. So the very act of communicating might be a valuable way for new connections, or in other words, new ideas to be formed, which means you might be missing opportunities if you don't communicate them with other people. The problem is, I don't really have, like, friends to do this with, so I'm just gonna keep going. Let's look at another example of combining existing ideas or memories, taking the memory of a rock and the memory of a stick and connecting them both into a new idea, the hammer, assuming you didn't already know what a hammer was before. If that's all new ideas are, are new connections or a combination of ideas or memories, then shouldn't you be able to do this externally? The same combination could have been made by a random number generator, right? by assigning objects to numbers, then through chance creating the connection or pattern of rock stick. We'll come back to this randomness thing later. This still isn't a new idea though, is it? It's just connecting already existing memories into something new. What about new ideas? Like something truly new, something in tune with Einstein's theory of general relativity. I mean, it's impossible to know for sure, but did Einstein come up with that theory based on already existing ideas or memories? Eh? How does a brain come up with something like a physics theory? What is it that our brain does? Well, when we think of the brain, a typical assumption might be of the brain reacting to certain sensory input, like receiving sensory input from our eyes and then making a reaction based on that input. It makes sense at first, but that's probably not the case. Instead, let's think of the brain as predictive instead of reactive. The brain has to solve an inverse inference problem, where it tries to guess the cause based on the effect. Your brain is in a dark box, which is your skull. If your light sensors are showing you this, what is the cause that is affecting your eyes to send these signals? Whoa. Great prediction. It's a YouTube video. So your brain constantly tries to predict what's going to happen based on past experience, and it begins to prepare your action while anticipating sensory input to confirm or deny the prediction. 
If it's confirmed, then it executes the plan of action, but if it's wrong and it receives something unexpected, it changes the plan of action and in the process learns and updates its internal model so it can make a better prediction next time. This is sort of what artificial intelligence is doing. It's taking a set of initial conditions and making a prediction of the outcome. As it turns out, this method is significantly less computationally demanding. For example, DLSS, where it renders a frame at a low resolution and then upscales it by guessing what it looks like in the higher resolution. This works really well and means the whole process of making a prediction of what the scene will look like is less demanding than actually rendering the whole scene. This requires a large amount of training to do well, but hey, after 10 or 20 years of existing, you amass quite a large amount of data or memories to draw on. Predicting and correcting, predicting and correcting turns out to be a much more metabolically efficient way to run a system. Constantly reacting also means there's no way for you to anticipate what's going to happen next, which would create a lot of uncertainty. So in this sense, your brain isn't really trying to come up with completely new information. It's instead trying to predict, based on past experience, what's going to happen. This doesn't involve creating information. It involves absorbing information and possibly utilizing that information to combine into new, useful information. Basically, if this plus this equal this, then what? up with a hammer, your brain predicts that this combination of objects will be useful to accomplish a certain set of tasks. Very useful. Now that we generally know how the brain operates, and know that the brain doesn't really create information, but instead combines it and mixes it together to form new connections, we can move back to random number generators. Our brain actually has a similar mechanism where neurons stochastically fire, creating noise or randomness. This actually has several ways it benefits the brain. It helps in decision making, it makes you more alert and react quicker, as well as helping with, you guessed it, creativity. Let's imagine two landscapes. One is a large mountain range with deep valleys, and the other is a much tamer landscape with gentle hills. Our brain networks are similar to these landscapes. Our thoughts, decisions, and memories are like valleys. These valleys are strong neural pathways creating an attraction, and the hillsides surrounding the valleys act as a basin of attraction. Similar to how water will flow down the side of the mountains, neuron signals entering the basin of attraction are directed towards the bottom of the valley. What happens when you recall a memory is an association or seemingly random input signal can happen in a basin of attraction. As the signal flows down the hillside, the memory is recalled and even potentially strengthened. Here is where things get interesting. The neurons in your brain are constantly sending spontaneous signals. In an average group of neurons, there are around 10 spikes per second, whereas neurons in an attractor state, the firing rates are higher. This means that although you might be attracted to the active neurons making all the noise, that it's possible that a random neuron somewhere might direct your attention towards it and form a new connection, letting you travel from one valley, or memory, to another valley, thus making a new connection or a new idea. Now remember how I said there are two landscapes, the mountains and gentle hills. These represent different signal to noise ratios and describe what Barbara Oakley referred to as the focused and diffused mode of thinking. In focused mode, the valleys are deep and it makes it hard to travel over the mountains to get to a different valley, whereas in diffused mode, it's much easier to cross the small hills. Therefore, random and spontaneous firings make it much easier to bring you from one basin to another. You can deliberately try to defocus and enter the diffused state, oftentimes taking a shower, washing dishes, or laying in my bed work to bring me from the mountains to the small hills. Randomness or noise in a system is a feature, not a bug. It helps the brain become information bearing building upon already existing memories or ideas and creating new ones. It's the same with genetics as well. What is it that makes life so diverse? It's through random mutations that a new thing can be created. Randomness is creative. So then, at this point, 
It's just a matter of integrating noise or randomness, right? This reminds me of how I create music sometimes. Obviously, there are certain criteria to make good music, like it has to actually sound good. But for the most part, to create a new melody, you just need to randomly place notes on a piano roll and go from there. Even Einstein's brain might not have been creating information. It may have just been associations and correlations made by noise in his brain, leading to what he called his happiest thought ever, imagining a man falling off of the roof of a house. This idea then led him to his theory of gravity and general relativity. It's easy to point out how obvious it was after the connection has already been made, but it seems as though Einstein just made a few connections with the pre-existing ideas or memories, like of a falling man, to come up with a new idea about gravity. I think we can build on this. There's another method of entering what I'd say is a state of really honing into the noise. It's like an extreme version of diffused mode. Even when I'm in the diffused mode, I'm still conscious and can direct my thoughts in certain directions. So in that kind of way, I might simply be limited by being awake. There's a thing called hypnagogia, which is a state of transition from awake to asleep. In this hypnagogic state of consciousness, you can experience hallucinations, lucid dreaming, and sleep paralysis. It's worth noting the opposite of hypnagogic is hypnopompic, where you're transitioning from asleep to awake. I think being in a hypnagogic state leads to effortlessly tuning into the noise. Similar to when you're dreaming, you just go with the flow, not really in control of what's happening. A lot of geniuses and creative people describe using this hypnagogic state to come up with ideas. Beethoven, Richard Wagner, Walter Scott, Salvador Dali, Thomas Edison, and Nikola Tesla have credited hypnagogia with enhancing their creativity, sometimes going out of their way to enter hypnagogia regularly, like Thomas Edison, holding a metal ball in his hand so that when he falls asleep, he drops it, resulting in a noise waking him up. This results in going into a hypnagogic state and then directly coming back out of it, which allows you to try and bring back some of those thoughts, instead of being forgotten like most dreams are. Salvador Dali used a similar technique substituting the ball with keys falling onto a plate. Even Isaac Newton claimed to have solved physics problems in similar states of daydreaming. Da Vinci might also be an example. With his unique sleeping schedule, it makes one wonder if that had an influence on his creativity. But wait, how can we forget Einstein himself? Supposedly, he too used this method similar to Dali and Edison, using a pencil to wake him up. But alas, the articles making these claims don't cite sources, and searching for myself, I couldn't find anything providing substantial proof. It's quite popular, so maybe there's some credence to it, but it could also very well be hogwash. Now, at this point, maybe I'm just picking examples to support my statements. Maybe there actually was something special about Einstein's brain that allowed him to come up with a new idea, but I think my original notion of new ideas is false. I don't think anybody really comes up with a new idea, at least in the sense of creating information from nothing. New ideas are simply the combination and new interpretation of old ideas, and I think it might be as simple as that. Anyway, farewell guys, I love you.